Good afternoon. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone for participating in today's uh, Zoom DC chapter Federalist Society lunch. Uh, I'm pleased that so many of you are, are joining uh, virtually, uh, and I look forward to upcoming uh, events where we will again uh, be in person at our traditional not so secret uh, location. Uh, my name is Reg Brown, and I am the president of the DC Federalist uh, Society chapter, uh, and we are really honored uh, today to have a spectacular uh, uh, program set up. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump uh, right uh, in. Um, we're honored today to have as our moderator uh, the Honorable Stephen A. Engel, former Assistant uh, Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, and now currently a uh, partner. Uh, at the Deckert uh, Law Firm, uh, which offers uh, high quality services. Uh, uh, if you've been injured, um, harmed uh, in any way, through no fault uh, of your own. Uh, uh, Stephen uh, is a graduate of Harvard and Cambridge uh, and Yale, and he managed to escape uh, from all three institutions uh, uh, without uh, any, uh, any harm. Uh, he also clerked uh, for Justice Kennedy on the U.S. Supreme Court, and I can think of uh, no more terrific uh, a, a guide uh, for today's conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Stephen to introduce uh, 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 our uh, honored speaker today. Thanks, Reg. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'd be happier to be in person uh, dining with you, and I'm definitely looking forward uh, to a return uh, to normalcy and uh, in-person lunches uh, in the future. Um, also, uh, very excited to hear from uh, our featured speaker today. Uh, Ed Whalen uh, is one of the leading commentators uh, on the judicial nominations process, uh, as well, frankly, of the federal courts. Uh, and he has been on the front lines of judicial nominations for uh, over three decades at this point. Uh, Ed uh, was the leading Republican staffer on the nominations of Justice Ginsburg uh, and Justice Breyer uh, during the Clinton administration, and he has closely followed and extensively commented on uh, all of the nominations on the Supreme Court uh, since then. Uh, as many of you know, Ed uh, regularly writes on judicial nominations uh, through the National Review's Bench Memos blog, uh, as well as in you know, many other media publications. Uh, his posts are, uh, they reflect not only a clear understanding of the work of the court, uh, but really extraordinary diligence when it comes to reviewing uh, and describing the records uh, of the nominees, both at the Supreme Court and, and frankly at the courts of appeals as well. Uh, and his insights are, are always informative and frankly, they often drive the debate uh, on Capitol Hill uh, and in other uh, media outlets. Uh, I could go on you know, long, longer about Ed's service in his career. He, uh, he ran the Office of Legal Counsel uh, as Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General and Acting Assistant Attorney General uh, for a, at a critical time in American history. Uh, but let me just flag one additional contribution before we get to talking about this. Ed is the co-editor of three volumes of Justice Scalia's legal writings uh, and his public speeches. And, and to my mind, frankly, there is no better way to become a better writer or a better thinker about the law than just sitting down and, and reading those volumes and reading the work of Justice Scalia. So if Ed had done nothing else other than compiled those volumes, I think standing alone, that would have been a, a tremendous contribution uh, to the law and extraordinary public service. So uh, I urge everybody to take a look at them if, if they don't already have the books. Uh, anyway, let's turn uh, to the discussion today, which of course centers on uh, Justice Breyer's impending retirement uh, and President Biden's nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson uh, to replace Justice Breyer at the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm going to start by asking Ed a number of questions uh, that I hope will will drive the discussion, uh, and then we'll open it up. Um, and and by open it up in in this Zoom format, uh, I would ask that folks use the Q and A function. Uh, as I understand it, if you ask these questions, I can see them. Uh, and then at the appropriate uh, time, I can I can ask them for Ed. So I think if we if we do that, um, you know, folks in the audience will have an opportunity to participate. So uh, let me start, um, Ed. Before we get uh, to the present day, 
Uh, why don't we go back to talking about your early experiences uh, on, the, on the Judiciary Committee uh, for a little bit, uh, because you know, we've obviously seen some fairly divisive uh, and partisan uh, nominations in recent years, particularly during the, the Trump years, but I'm not sure that that's always been the case. And I'd be interested to get your perspective on uh, how things were uh, at the Judiciary Committee during the Clinton administration and the nomination specifically of Justice Ginsburg and, and Justice Breyer. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Let me first thank you for taking part uh, in this. It's not often that a moderator uh, is more qualified uh, than a speaker, but uh, grateful to ha have you here. Uh, yeah, I was privileged to be the lead Republican staffer on the Ginsburg and Breyer nominations back in 1993 and 1994, and it was indeed a different era. Republican senators, uh, for reasons we can discuss more fully, um, were uh, even after the Bork and Thomas hearings, embracing the, the model of senatorial deference uh, to a president, uh, basically saying that um, the, uh, the Senate, opposite party senators, ought to confirm someone who is objectively qualified, independent of issues of judicial philosophy. Now, you know, you can have a debate over whether that's even a coherent notion, that is, how you can be objectively qualified if you have an unsound judicial philosophy. But that was the approach. And of course, uh, Justice Ginsburg was confirmed uh, overwhelmingly, 96 to 3. Stephen Breyer, um, 87 to 9. In both instances, uh, President Clinton consulted very closely, almost on a daily basis, with my boss, Orrin Hatch, who in turn consulted, consulted very closely with me, and uh, was very interested in, in um, Senator Hatch's assistance in picking a nominee who would not trigger a fight. This is despite the fact that uh, Democrats had a 53 to 47 majority in the Senate. There was no prospect of a filibuster, but uh, Bill Clinton was really looking for, uh, for a way to avoid a fight, and uh, Senator Hatch was very eager to help him do so. On Breyer in particular, uh, I ran across the other day uh, an account from back then of what happened. Uh, it struck me as very true, and I would just read a couple passages uh, from it. When Clinton began looking for a new Supreme Court justice six weeks ago, he made no secret he wanted a nationally known politician who could give, who could give the court a down-to-earth populist touch. He wanted a future giant in the, in the liberal footsteps of William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall. He could look a mile away at the Department of the Interior to find such a potential paragon in Bruce Babbitt, who of course had been a uh, former governor of, of Arizona. But picking Babbitt would have meant a nasty spat with Orrin Hatch and other Western senators. So we ended up with Stephen Breyer, someone very, very different in so many ways from what Clinton said he was, he was looking for. Uh, Howard Metzenbaum, uh, uh, some of you remember as a very liberal senator from uh, uh, Ohio, according to this article, grumped, backing off someone because of Orrin Hatch's opposition is embarrassing. And uh, I, I'm grateful that my colleagues back then actually give me, uh, you know, a credit in a, in a you know, but for way for stoking some of the opposition, uh, including from uh, Democratic senators that, that led uh, Clinton to back off Bruce Babbitt and go with Stephen Breyer. So what you saw back then was a, a very different model uh, on the Republican side. Uh, again, this deference model, things have shifted uh, in the intervening decades to a battle over ju judicial philosophy. We can have a discussion over just how that happened, why it happened, uh, whether it's good or not. I, I um, generally think it is good. Uh, you could also see what happened back then, the um, very short-term focus that, um, that White Houses under any president uh, are tempted to have when it comes to Supreme Court nominations. Uh, Clinton had run uh, as a centrist uh, 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 and governed as a, as, a, as, a, as a liberal and was uh, in hot water politically and didn't want to didn't want to fight. He wanted he wanted an easy battle on, on both Ginsburg and Breyer. He got those, um, but to the consternation of, of, of folks on the left. So um, with that, um, you know, it, it sure seems like the decades have flown by. I, I, uh, it, it seems like yesterday that I was, I was reviewing Stephen Breyer's record. Now I'm reviewing Katanji Brown Jackson's and uh, a lot's happened in the interim. Um, and, and speaking about uh, what's happened in the interim, I mean, it really seems as though over the last 30 years, we've seen it's become more and more difficult 
you know, in, in more and more partisan in, in, in filling the court. Um, what, to what do you, do you attribute that? Uh, you know, you, we, we had significant Democratic opposition uh, during, you know, President Bush's administration, and we had discussion of at least of an effort to filibuster Justice Alito. Obviously, then, you know, maybe Kagan, Sotomayor, still a lot of opposition, albeit maybe not, not quite the same. And so, so, I mean, what do you see as someone who's been looking at this for, you know, for decades of, of these trend lines? Well, what's happened is that the political parties have um, polarized more and more over issues of judicial philosophy. The political bases of each party have driven senators, I, I think against their preferences, um, to oppose nominees uh, on the grounds of judicial philosophy. You see the escalation. Uh, again, what was remarkable about Ginsburg and Breyer is this wasn't long after Bork and Thomas. The deference model was not going to be reciprocated. No one could have thought that then. Um, but Republican senators, I think, actually found it in their self-interest uh, to invoke this deference model, show how reasonable they were. A very easy way to win a re-election campaign is to uh, not give the other side any issues. Uh, but by um, 2005, when the, the, the two vacancies opened up that uh, Roberts and Alito <clears throat> have, have, have filled, things had changed a lot. Uh, you had had, in particular, the unprecedented campaign of partisan filibusters against uh, George W. Bush's appellate nominees. Mm. Uh, and uh, there could be no illusion that uh, Democrats um, were going to back down. You had um, an actual filibuster effort against uh, Alito, led by uh, John Kerry from the ski slopes of Davos, Switzerland. Uh, it failed, but it, again, it marked the fact that, that, um, that these fights were going to get um, uh, very ardent. And what you saw then is as the focus shifted to judicial philosophy, the filibuster first became uh, viewed as an available weapon. Republicans did not turn to that uh, in 2009, 2010. Instead, they voted in large numbers in the 30s, I believe, against both um, Sotomayor uh, and Kagan, but uh, did not make any efforts to, to obstruct, did not um, uh, engage in the politics of personal destruction. I uh, really fought those those um, those nominations um, on the grounds of judicial philosophy, uh, ridiculing uh, President Obama's notorious empathy standard, uh, for example, in which he said that the critical ingredient uh, is what's in a uh, what's in a nominee's heart, not 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 uh, in that nominee's um, uh, legal abilities. So uh, then, what we saw to fast forward a little bit to the vacancy that arose after Justice Scalia's death. Um, you know, first you had the keeping the seat open for a year, which, you know, frankly, was something that was, had been baked in the cake in the process for a long time. Joe Biden had threatened that way back in 1992. Uh, uh, Chuck Schumer threatened the same thing in July of 2007, more than a year before the election. Uh, what you had in, 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 in uh, 2016 upon Justice Scalia's death, for the first time since Justice Thomas's nomination, uh, you had a president of one party making uh, a nomination to a Senate controlled by the opposite party. That's exactly the configuration that's most um, likely to produce conflict, uh, um, or stalemate. Uh, and when you add to that, that this was the, uh, in the view of many, myself included, the iconic Scalia seat and then threatened to transform the court. Uh, what happened in, uh, in, in 2016, as I say, was, was, was baked into the cake. And uh, President Obama's Former White House counsel acknowledged as much afterwards when she said that if the political polarities had been reversed, she would have recommended that Democratic senators do exactly what Republican senators did. Mm -hmm. So then you had uh, President Trump's uh, nomination of, of, of Neil Gorsuch in January of 2017. And for context, it's important to have in mind that uh, back in, in November 2013, Harry Reid uh, and Senate Democrats abolished the filibuster for lower court nominees while leaving it in place for the time being for Supreme Court nominees. And if you look back, um, they did that explicitly because abortion groups were afraid that a Republican president um, with a Republican uh, majority in the Senate might be able to confirm anti-Roe nominees. And there's no way they wanted that to, 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 um, to be made available. Uh, so even in October of 2016, a week or two before the election, Harry Reid was crowing that if Republicans were to, were to stand in the way of, or try to filibuster any of, of, of Hillary's Supreme Court nominees, 
Democrats would abolish the remaining filibuster for the Supreme Court nom nom nominated just like that. Well, to everyone's, well, to the surprise of many, uh, Donald Trump was elected in, in uh, November 2016. And Democrats made the historically idiotic decision to filibuster the Gorsuch nomination. Uh, lots of folks seem to think that, that, that uh, Mitch McConnell has, you know, this extraordinary power on his own and that he could have, uh, that, that he could have abolished the Supreme Court um, uh, filibuster, um, irrespective of any other considerations, whether or not uh, um, Reed had laid the groundwork by doing what he did in 2013. I think there's lots of um, compelling evidence um, to show the contrary. And I think and, and you can indeed see that folks like John McCain, others who are critical to the abolition of the filibuster uh, for the Supreme Court in, in, uh, in 2017, made clear that uh, it was only the, the, the fact that here you had a nominee, Neil Gorsuch, who had received lots of praise for both sides, and if they were going to filibuster Neil Gorsuch, no one would ever get through. So, uh, you know, I, I think it was, a, the, the, it was a wonderful thing that they chose to do this um, blunder, which Chuck Schumer knew was a blunder, but he couldn't stand up to his base. And, you know, if you look forward from there, there's no way that um, Brett Kavanaugh um, would have been confirmed. He probably never would have been nominated if the filibuster had remained in place. There's no way that Amy Coney Barrett uh, would have had her confirmation um, uh, take place in such a short time. So that really was a, a, a transformational event. But what you had then, you know, so you had this push on judicial philosophy, uh, each side um, with the Democrats trying to maximize it by filibustering. And then um, we're back now to a situation uh, in which majority controls. And that's, you know, that's the essential fact going forward and, and why even with their very narrow margin, uh, Democrats are likely to have the votes uh, to confirm Ketanji Brown Jackson. Yep, no, that makes sense. I mean, it also, it shows, it shows of course, the slippery slope uh, on, on the filibuster. I mean, obviously the, the decision to get rid of the filibuster for circuit court nominees made it you know, fairly difficult to sort of argue that somehow there's a line of principle that, that needs to be maintained. And uh, as you're right, I mean, if, if in the but for world where uh, the Democrats didn't insist on that in 2017. It's at least an open question whether, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, the, the two, the next two nominees, uh, you know, would have been those uh, in a position to overrule the filibuster. So let's let's talk about. Uh, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead if you want to. Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, but let, let's talk about uh, where we are now. Um, you know, after I think some fairly, uh, you know, divisive, if not brutal, uh, nom nominations in the Trump administration. It, it's not clear to me, at least from what we've seen in the early going, that uh, that we're going to have such a process. You've you obviously you've seen, uh, you know, prominent, uh, you know, Republicans or former Republican judges, you know, like Judge Griffith or Judge Ludig, come out uh, in support of the nominee. I don't know that the uh, the music, so to speak, uh, suggests uh, that there are a lot of people gearing up, um, at least in the same terms. So obviously, judicial philosophy is fair game and will be asked, but I mean, are, are we at a return to normalcy? Is, is it something in which the civility, you know, is only one way? I mean, how, how would you explain explain this? Well, I think we're going to see something uh, similar to what we saw in 2009 and 2010 with the Sotomayor and, and Kagan nominations, where I think um, Republican senators were respectful, um, waged the battle on the ground of judicial philosophy, voted in large numbers uh, against the nominee. Um, I don't see any reason for Republican senators to think that they can reestablish a norm of deference uh, uh, by voting in large numbers um, for Katanji Brown Jackson. Nor do I see um, why they would find anything in her, in her record that would that would justify those votes. If again, judicial philosophy um, remains front and center. Look, she has some. Um, Katanji Brown Jackson has lots of admirable personal qualities. I I know folks who know her who. Think very highly of her and and and, and like her a lot. Um, I, I would say she's um, objectively um, amply qualified for the position, even though I think some of the uh, uh, assessments of her as uh, um, are, are just way over the top. Um, people who, who feel the need to uh, not simply support her but um, uh, exaggerate um, her her qualifications. Uh, look, it is a historic um, first nomination of an African-American female. Um, that's, of course, a commitment that Joe Biden made um, as a political commitment on the campaign trail, um, arguably 
uh, it helped him uh, win the primary and, and um, thus um, later the, the presidency. Uh, it's seemed, that commitment seems not to have been received very well, at least at the one poll I saw of the American public was accurate. And it's striking that um, last Friday when uh, uh, President Biden announced his nomination with Ketanji Brown Jackson present, there was really no, no mention at all, um, except very, very obliquely of, of the, um, the historic significance um, of this nomination. Look, I think we can all recognize that, um, that African-Americans and African-American women, um, you know, uh, in particular have suffered uh, lots of indignities and racism over the years and can take um, uh, pleasure and a certain joy in this um, landmark nomination, even as we see that, um, uh, Judge Jackson as a nominee whom uh, Republicans uh, should oppose. So I expect this to be a, a, a very <clears throat> civil um, uh, process. Uh, the other side has shown itself uh, way too ready to um, screech racism or sexism at any scrutiny um, of, of the nominee's record. Uh, obviously, it would be you know, you know, foolish of Republican senators to say things that, that uh, would actually warrant those sorts of attacks. Um, let me mention, though, um, that you know, Joe Biden back in 2005 when, a, when, a vacant, when, a, when uh, Justice O'Connor had announced that she was uh, stepping down, threatened on national TV uh, to filibuster um, the possible nomination of Janice Rogers Brown, uh, an, Afri an, an distinguished African-American judge who had just joined the DC circuit but had a long career before as a California Supreme Court justice. I mentioned this um, uh, in part because it, illustrates that Biden himself recognized that concerns of judicial philosophy um, provide ample reason to um, oppose a nominee, in his case, even to threaten the filibuster, um, you know, uh, notwithstanding um, the fact that the, that the nominee is uh, an African-American female. So likewise, I think Republican senators now focusing on judicial philosophy have um, plenty of basis uh, to, to oppose her. It's, so you're, you're suggesting that the senator should decide whether or not to oppose a nominee based upon their judicial record rather than their race or sex. I, a, a, a daring thought, I know, almost uh, 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 something that Martin Luther King Jr. might say. Uh, <laughs> um, but actually, let, let's say before we before we go away from uh, from the demographics question, let me just ask you know one of one of the questions that we've heard or one of the the arguments that we heard is that uh, President Biden's commitment uh, to appoint a black woman was not that different from President Reagan's suggestion he would appoint. Uh, the first woman to the Supreme Court, perhaps uh, President Bush's uh, decision to replace the retiring Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, with Justice Thomas. You know that. You know, do you believe that it is appropriate uh, to take demographics into account when it comes to the court? Are these legitimate considerations, and do you think that these some of these past historical models are, you know, are, are opposite precedents? Well, demographic considerations have often played a role in uh, judicial selections, including Supreme Court selections. And I would be um, hard pressed to see how you can make a case that they um, absolutely can't. Uh, I do think that there are um, issues, um, both um, political um, and perhaps even constitutional, about uh, declaring in advance that you are going to nominate someone uh, only of a particular race. And here I'd emphasize that, of course, for constitutional purposes, uh, race and sex are, are, are distinct. That is, um, uh, racial discrimination is uh, generally understood to be um, subjected to higher scrutiny than, 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 than uh, sex discrimination. I don't particularly want to defend uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, selection of Senator Day O'Connor uh, in, in 1981, nor uh, the promise that he made uh, on the campaign uh, trail. Uh, look, some folks say that um, Donald Trump um, made a similar promise uh, immediately after um, Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death. It's hard to know with Donald Trump, but I think he may have been giving you a peek or a preview more than more than a some sort of abstract commitment. I mean, he had already nominated two justices by then. The process is moving very fast. I think it was three days later that he nominated Amy Coney Barrett, who had apparently been the runner up to the previous nomination. And of course, he wasn't um, he wasn't campaigning um, at at the time, so that 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 particular episode does not seem to me um, analogous. The Reagan one 
uh, it, it is closer, though again, there with the distinction of, of, uh, of, of, of sex rather than race. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, Judge Jackson. Um, let me ask for first a question. I, I think there are a lot of people who are following the court and particularly after um, President Biden's commitment to, to nominate a black woman who assumed uh, that Judge Jackson was going to be the pick. She had been elevated soon after he took uh, he came to the bench to fill uh, Attorney General Garland's seat at the time. Uh, and I think I, obviously there are many people, you know, in the to the progressive or on the left side of the nominations process who, you know, have to think very highly of her and, and were pushing her from the beginning. Did you ever think, do you think that this was an open process or had President Biden kind of made the choice, you know, was it baked in at the beginning? Well, I think she was a front runner all along. I predicted very early on that, that, that she would be the nominee. Uh, I don't know that he had actually decided, if he, if he had decided, I don't know why he took a month to announce his decision. I don't see how that, 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 that process uh, served his interests um, or the nominees. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a few years ago, when Demand Justice first put out uh, its list of uh, candidates uh, for the next Democratic president to uh, appoint, to nominate to the Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson was conspicuously not on that list. It's a long list, uh, 25 or so names, and Katanji Brown Jackson had been in the news back in 2016 as a possible shortlister for the Scalia vacancy. So this is not an inadvertent omission. Uh, my um, speculation is that she was not on the list because folks on the left were very concerned that she had served uh, on an, uh, the advisory board of a um, Baptist uh, school that um, boldly proclaimed orthodox Christian moral beliefs on matters of sexuality, uh, marriage, life, uh, and that um, I, I think what uh, at some point, one way or another, um, she uh, managed to convince uh, demand justice when it um, issued its amended list that um, you know they didn't have to worry. She didn't really um, believe those things. Now I'm not sure that. Um, uh, uh, Failing to believe in the the, 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 the charter that governs uh, the body you're operating on is the best qualification for a Supreme Court justice, but you know it was enough to get to to, to get her um, uh, added to the list. Look, there were two other contenders prominently mentioned. Um, I, I my own assessment, I think that of many on the left, is that the um, candidate who is uh, of the highest quality and who would um, plausibly have been on any Democratic president's shortlist um, uh, without any um, uh, litmus test at the outset was Leandra Kruger, a California Supreme Court justice. Uh, now, she had turned down an opportunity to be Solicitor General uh, for Biden. Uh, I think um, she was viewed, well, she's viewed as a, as a moderate on a very liberal California Supreme Court. Uh, I think that translates into liberal uh, uh, anywhere else, but I think that 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 um, casting did not help her. And I think there were other reasons. Uh, I mean, there was a, a prominent African American civil rights lawyer who, a day before um, uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination, basically said that Ketanji Brown Jackson is representative of um, blacks and her life experiences in a way he suggested implicitly, without naming Leandra Kruger, that that Kruger was not. So um, a, a sort of uh, uh, interesting playing of the race card uh, against her. I, I explained uh, um, two or three weeks before the nomination why I did not think she would be nominated. Uh, and I also never saw Michelle Childs, the, the third candidate, as a very plausible choice. Uh, she, as many of you know, is a district judge in South Carolina, a protege of Jim Clyburn, who's the congressman who extracted uh, from Joe Biden um, uh, during the camp campaign, the promise that his first Supreme Court justice would be an African-American woman. Just before Christmas, and a surprise to many of us, um, Biden nominated Michelle Childs to a, a DC circuit seat that had been open for 10 months, while uh, evidently some sort of real battle had been going on behind the scenes. And I think that was quite a victory uh, for, uh, uh, for Jim Clyburn, and I uh, never really believed that he could um, uh, you know, leverage it into a, a Supreme Court nomination, especially when mm -hmm. folks came out from the left um, with objections to Michelle Child's concern that she might be um, uh, not be with them on labor issues. And you know, more broadly, Michelle Child is unknown 
um, to legal liberals in DC and um, people um, in, in this process just trust what they don't know, which is understandable. Yeah, no, I thought, you know, looking at the tea leaves, uh, you know, obviously Judge Jackson was was elevated. I, I thought that when, when Judge Childs was put uh, towards the DC circuit, that suggested that at least she had some supporters in the administration who you know, were setting her up for, uh, you know, potentially for a future. I, I actually thought, and I know no info on this, but I thought it's interesting that uh, that Leandra Kruger hasn't actually been put on an open Ninth Circuit seat yet. And I don't know if that could be her choice or that could also reflect, uh, you know, the fact that maybe the White House isn't isn't all on board, so to speak, with with there. But, you know, there'll, there'll be other Ninth Circuit seats for her, I would imagine, if, if this is something that they want. Well, and there's a good question. I need to look at what the comparative salaries are. But there's a good question whether, whether you'd rather be a California Supreme Court justice or or be, you know, one of 29 uh, judges in regular active service on the on the the the, uh, the the zoo that we call the Ninth Circuit. Um, you know, I, 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 a, a sane person might well um, decide to stay where she is. <laughs> That's right. Uh, fair enough. Um, so speaking speaking actually about these uh, President Biden's potential choices uh, and and what we see is sort of you know the objective qualifications for Judge Jackson. Uh, what we see in her is something we've increasingly seen, um, you know, uh, to the nominees of the court. Uh, and some people have commented on this. Obviously, she's got the she got the Harvard background, uh, the Ivy League pedigree. She has clerked on the Supreme Court, which is increasingly becoming, uh, you know, a qualification. Uh, you know, and of course, well, she was she actually different from some of the, from most of the others was had a very short record as an appellate judge. She she is in fact coming from the D.C. Circuit, which. Uh, you know, th that court and other courts of appeals have been the landing ground. Um, is this, are, are, are we reaching a position in which Ivy League Supreme Court clerkship and circuit court judgeship are uh, requirements uh, to be on the Supreme Court? Well, it's worth pondering why that's been happening. Uh, and I think one can see um, several different factors in play. Um, one is that uh, rightly or wrongly, and uh, I, I would um, be inclined to emphasize the wrongly, um, Folks see um, Ivy League branding as um, some sort of sign of quality. Uh, you know, in some cases it might be that, in other cases not at all. And you know, it's, the whole the whole experience of a modern legal miseducation uh, anywhere, uh, you know, is uh, enough to, to to give one pause. I think there's also though a, a, a networking effect. Uh, that is, I think um, when you go to a place like Harvard and Yale, um, you um, make you know, you have classmates and colleagues, uh, especially if you're in DC who are in all sorts of powerful positions, you get to know them, uh, you can help advance um, your cause uh, through them. Uh, look, there's also a, a, a meritocratic element, um, maybe it's not really merit, but perceived merit, where I think um, what you've seen in recent decades, um, much more so than say 60 years ago, is, um, you know, Harvard and Yale uh, uh, and, and other schools too, um, attracting the best students based on you know the criteria they use uh, from around the nation. Uh, so um, you know I think if you look at justices who were uh, nominated uh, decades ago, I don't have clearly in mind good examples, but you may have had some brilliant legal minds who 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 uh, went to schools that um, that weren't um, as well known as say Harvard and Yale are these days. Okay, fair enough. It, it certainly seems to have, to have been the pattern here. So I, I know that you have, you know, read a great deal of Judge Jackson's uh, record, particularly on the district court. She obviously had, you know, only a couple of recent opinions on her time from the D.C. circuit. Um, uh, what can we draw from from her body of work? What, what is what is, you know, can we can, do we have you have a sense of where her what is her judicial philosophy? Well, I think during her D.C. Circuit uh, hearing, she basically said she doesn't have a judicial philosophy and hasn't had an opportunity to develop one. And in fairness to her, um, you know, as a district court judge uh, for eight, I think, I believe eight years, constrained by precedent, um, deciding um, uh, lots of, I don't, I don't mean to say unimportant cases, but, you know, lots of routine cases day in, day out, uh, you're not really going to have uh, much of an opportunity to show your colors. Now, she did have a few high profile cases uh, during the Trump years in which she wrote opinions of more than 100 pages 
um, and uh, so some of them seem to be attention grabbing. I know Steve, you might be familiar with at least a, a couple of those that may have uh, uh, rejected your handiwork. Um, though in, in turn, uh, you know, she I think faced um, uh, reversals in, uh, in in either all three or at least two two of those cases. I don't have the details clearly in mind right now. Um, I will say. Uh, so look, I, I think you, you look through her record, um, uh, these three cases aside, and you don't see much that's, that's particularly ideological. Um, one thing that I pointed out when the, the selection process was still going on is I think that uh, Leandra Kruger is a much better writer. Uh, now, this is not a reason to, to oppose Katanji Brown Jackson's nomination. At this point, it might be, even be a reason to welcome it. Um, but her um, writing can often be very clunky uh, and um, it's not especially fluid. I mean, she look, she's a perfectly competent writer. I'm just saying by the high standards of, of really uh, elegant legal writing, uh, she doesn't meet that. And I've um, done a couple posts uh, illustrating that. There also was a post put up by um, legal writing guru Ross Guberman uh, expressing very much the same thoughts. He, uh, faced uh, some sort of immediate backlash um, uh, and, 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 and took the post down while never retracting his assessment. I've summarized uh, uh, what he had to say on, 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 uh, in one long post. Um, you know, look, she's a very, by all accounts, a very congenial person. Uh, I, I, she, um, you know, her colleagues have enjoyed her. I think she'll be uh, someone who, who, uh, you know, gets along with her colleagues and uh, which way that cuts, um, you know, whether that means that, that, uh, that she's less likely to dissent or whether she uh, brings them along in some things, uh, who knows. Uh, the comparison has often been made uh, on, on Kruger versus um, Jackson as similar to uh, Kagan versus Sotomayor. That is, um, many of us, and I think this includes um, some, uh, some legal liberals, um, though they may have been more reluctant to say so publicly, uh, viewed Kruger as the um, more savvy um, liberal, someone who um, has um, greater legal acumen in the way that many of us think that um, Elena Kagan does versus Sonia Sotomayor, and who um, might be more effective in, in um, forging coalitions, being strategic, uh, and uh, you know, seeing uh, Sotomayor and perhaps uh, Jackson as someone who's more ready to uh, go her own way. I actually don't see, I'm looking at the district court record, I don't, I don't, these, these three opinions aside, I don't see much, much bombast in, in um, Jackson's legal writing. So I'm not ready to, to put her uh, in the Sotomayor uh, category. Um, look, she'll be, um, you know, there's every reason to think she'll be a, um, a uh, solid progressive on everything that matters uh, to them. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't expect that, that um, she'll be coming over uh, to uh, join conservatives and they didn't, won't be doing so anytime that Elena Kagan um, uh, isn't already doing so. Well, one of the, one of the things that um, President Biden emphasized and that at least the media suggests was important was that she actually comes from the, having been a public defender which actually is, you know, d does cut against the grain of uh, a lot of judicial nominees prior to the Biden administration. It's very par for the course with, with President Biden's nominees, but President Obama often picked uh, prosecutors and, and, and the like. Uh, to what extent do you think that background is, is either shows up in the, you know, her district court record that you've read or is likely to be a factor uh, when she's on the court? I don't think it... Uh... It, it's going to show much at all. Indeed, I think it's one, one aspect of her record that's been greatly exaggerated. Uh, there's a criminal defense lawyer who, who uh, blogs a lot called um, Scott Greenfield. He wrote an excellent post over the weekend. Um, I wrote a little bit about it today. Uh, he points out that you know she spent two years doing appellate work as a public defender. She wasn't uh, you know the one there with the, the defendant at trial. I'm not, I'm not disparaging uh, her, her role. I'm just saying it's not what you typically think of in terms of public defender work. Interestingly, this was also part of what um, she, I, th I think, light, lightly called um, a, a decade of uh, being a, quote, professional vagabond. Uh, and, um, and it's, I'm, I'm actually impressed, uh, and I, I wrote about this today, uh, that, that right after her briar clerkship, 
she had a series of jobs that one could easily um, read as uh, downward mobility and might wonder if this is signaling um, some sort of uh, uh, problem on, on her part. But she instead explained in her uh, tenure class notes for the Harvard Law Review class of 1996, in other words, notes that came out in the uh, spring of 2006, that she was really working on, uh, as she put it, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's the, 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 the mommy, uh, I'm, the work, the work, working mom, uh, the working mom thing, I think is how she put it. And I think it's a real credit to her that she was making uh, sacrifices, uh, figuring out how to uh, balance uh, work and life, uh, and that that led her to take um, jobs that would not um, ordinarily um, uh, be on, uh, on the horizon. But I think that desire, that commendable desire, I should, I should add, um, explains her job choices um, in uh, that decade more than uh, uh, any particular um, uh, commitment to the public defense role. Now, again, I'm sure she respects that role, and I, I, I don't mean to suggest otherwise, and, and um, maybe it will have some value. But um, Scott Greenfield makes a point. He, doesn't, he just doesn't think that he says she you know, barely um, uh, you know, put, put, put a spot in the seat before she, she left, and he doesn't think it would really uh, shape her much. He, uh, he even said it might shape, it might misshape her in the way that you know Harry Blackman thought that he uh, understood medicine uh, by virtue of being uh, the Mayo Clinic's <laughs> doctor. So uh, maybe a bit of a of, of a of a low shot on his part, but um, <laughs> interesting uh, yeah. nonetheless. Yep, yeah, fair enough. And and then the you know another another kind of differentiator for her is she actually will have been a district court judge for I think really much longer than anyone. Obviously, uh, Justice Sotomayor was. On the district court, but um, but I think maybe only for a few years, if, if my math is not is not off. But um, uh, just a, just a year or two less. I think it's about yeah. Okay, I think, but, was six, I think it was six or seven years. Yeah, I mean, do you think that that is likely to matter to her ability, you know, or how she will do her work uh, on the Supreme Court? Sure. Well, look, I think um, every justice um, brings to the job a, a, a mix of that justice's past experience, and that's obviously going to shape how the justice views and understands things. And uh, I think uh, someone who has been a district judge is going to understand a lot more about, uh, you know, the, perhaps the importance of summary judgment in some contexts, um, uh, you know, whether or not, how much weight um, to, 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 to give to uh, certain claims. Obviously, the role of an appellate judge is very different from that of, of a trial judge. I will emphasize that she actually had very little trial experience, uh, which this may be emblematic of what's happening in the, 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 the um, D.C. federal courts. I don't I don't mean to suggest I haven't looked with anything unusual, but I think I believe over the course of her eight years, she had a grand total of 12 trials, um, nine jury, um, three uh, judge trials. Michelle Childs, by contrast, over a slightly longer period, had 60 uh, trials, and she also had had a um, uh, I think countless trials uh, as, a, as a state judge. So uh, yeah, look, I think her um, experience as a district judge will inform and, 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 and enrich her role as a um, Supreme Court justice if she's confirmed. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to overstate its effect. And again, Sotomayor has um, uh, nearly as much. Uh, I don't know whether Justice Alito's experience as uh, running a U.S. attorney's office uh, yeah, you think that would give you know some insights too into what happens um, at the trial level? Though he was primarily running that office, not 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 doing not doing trials. Oh, um, fair enough. But I, I think probably she the the reason she had only relatively few number of trials is because she was mostly doing FOIA cases, which appears <laughs> to be the the, the principal uh, uh, purpose for the uh, federal district court for DC. That that and striking down Trump administration regulations, but uh, but they they, they they they're not doing that these days. So. Um, so uh, just opening up to some of the questions that we've received, and I encourage uh, other folks listening to use the Q&A function if they want to uh, have their questions heard. Um, one of the questions asked, one of the questioners asks, um, you know, she, as it's been reported that as a, a federal district judge, she's ha she was reversed a couple of times, uh, you know, with her, uh, her decisions. Uh, do, do that suggest, you know, in your mind that, you know, that should that be embarrassing? Or was, was she was she wrong? Uh, does you know the fact that, or do those cases tell us something about her 
uh, her judicial philosophy. Well, look, every district judge um, who's sat for any length of time is probably going to be reversed. Uh, I, I don't put any particular weight in um, the numbers of reversals or statistical numbers. Uh, you know, believe it or not, uh, too, appellate judges can often get things wrong. <laughs> so so uh, that, that, that said, I mean, uh, I, reversals, I do believe that, by the way, <laughs> reversals are, are occasions for looking more closely. I mean, it, it's something that would draw your attention to. Let's look at what she had to say in this ruling. Let's look at what the appellate panel had to say. And I think you see in uh, two or three of her reversals that there were um, liberal members of the D.C. Circuit who were um, part of the uh, panels reversing her. And look, I do not see anything necessarily ideological in the cases in which she was reversed. I do have some concerns about you know, whether her opinions were of the highest quality in terms of legal analysis. Uh, but again, that's something that um, you know is primarily for um, the White House to um, uh, assess when it was deciding among candidates. I'm not. I'm not going to suggest uh, that it uh, pr provides uh, a, a ground for Republican senators to um, to oppose um, the, the nomination. But I, I, I do think that it's again worth looking at reversals to see. Okay, was this something where the law was unclear? Is this something where the judge um, just made a mistake? Or was a judge right and the higher court wrong? And um, you know, it 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 warrants careful um, assessment and not not just oh, uh, so and so got reversed X times, therefore um, that that's a problem. Fair enough. Um, one one of our uh, questioners uh, uh, points out, by the way, that Chief Justice Berger uh, attended the Mitchell Hamline School of Law in Minneapolis, so he. Uh, outside of the, the Harvard Yale belt, albeit it was, not, not, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, not, not, not sure which way that cuts, but maybe, it's <laughs> not, maybe not. Uh, it was also, it was 1931. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think we, we got to go back 90 years. Uh, um, uh, but she, she also asks, um, has, has Brian Garner commented, you, you had talked about the, the writing style of Judge Jackson has, has Brian Garner, um, weighed in or dared, uh, to weigh in on, on this question. Uh, to my knowledge, he has not. And after seeing what happened when uh, Ross Guberman, you know, put his toes in the water, my guess is, uh, you know, that 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 he, he's not going to. Um, you know, I, I I just think if you're if you're running a I, I don't you know if you're if you're running a business um, uh, selling your legal writing services to lots of folks, you don't want to you know piss off your customers, and that's uh, it's understandable. Um, it is curious to me that 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 some people. Um, uh, Claim, oh, Ross Guberman uh, depublished what he wrote. Therefore, supposedly he doesn't believe it. Well, he's never he's never said he doesn't believe it. And you know, look at his careful analysis. There's no reason to imagine that he doesn't believe it. Yeah, no, I think that that may speak more of the the, the climate, uh, public climate on, on the internet and social media these days than, than anything else. But that's a different topic, which uh, uh, from our current one. Um, uh, another another questioner asks: uh, Is it uncommon for the nomination process to be done? Uh, before the sitting justice actually retires? Are there precedents for that? Well, uh, you know, there have been lots of justices who uh, retire upon confirmation of their successor. So in those cases, the confirmation process always concludes before the vacancy actually arises. So that, for example, was a case with uh, Justice O'Connor in, 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 in 2005. Um, it, it's that's that's frequently been the case. I think there may be a concern that if something happens, you don't want to leave the court uh, as shorthanded. But what we do have here is unusual. Uh, you know, Justice Breyer informed the White House very early, much earlier than than, than happened, say, in, uh, with with uh, Ginsburg and Breyer in '93, '94, much earlier than than happened um, with uh, um, uh, Sotomayor and Kagan, or more precisely with um, Souter and uh, Stevens. Uh, in 2009 and 2010. And I think it's pretty clear that he was expecting the White House to have the sense to keep it quiet <laughs> uh, and, and to, to get their act together and then to ha have some sort of ceremony later uh, in which um, they, 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 they could avoid this month long spectacle in which um, folks can publicly debate uh, the, the, the merits of the candidates. But yeah, you're, here you can have a situation in which, um, look, it's likely that Ketanji Brown Jackson will be confirmed sometime in April. The Senate has a two week recess right in the middle of April. Uh, Senate Democrats may push to get her confirmed beforehand. I think with the delay, it may be more likely it happens afterwards. But either way, you can have a period of, of, of uh, you know, two plus months uh, 
before Breyer's resignation, in which uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson will uh, presumably remain a DC Circuit judge, uh, but will not be doing, as I understand it, under uh, DC Circuit practice, any any work. She'll have a nice vacation, which you know, uh, uh, per perhaps well deserved after all these years. I think Merrick Garland uh, had a similar uh, vacation of sorts uh, in in, in two thousand. 16, because I believe the practice has been, and this wasn't the case back, when, say, when Justice Scalia um, was, was nominated in, in 1986, the, the practice has been, uh, once you're nominated, um, you don't do any more work. Indeed, we saw a few um, orders and decisions seemingly rush out last week in the DC Circuit on Thursday, not, not the usual day for these things, uh, and, and um, lots of us read this perhaps mistakenly as a, as a, as, as a hint that, um, that Jackson would be um, the, the, the nominee. But yeah, there's gonna be this sort of strange period of, 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 of uh, two months or so in which uh, she has been confirmed, but not appointed. Um, I wanna emphasize these discrete steps. I think perhaps everyone already knows them, but these terms are often used um, sloppily, including by folks who you think um, would uh, know better. But um, Nomination uh, is, of course, uh, the, the step that um, takes place at the beginning. Uh, traditionally, it's been understood um, not uh, that doesn't require an actual vacancy to exist. Traditionally, it's been understood to uh, require um, the announcement of an intention to resign. So there's an interesting constitutional question uh, whether you could, you know, whether Biden today could. Uh, nominate uh, someone for all, 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 um, all eight of the other uh, Supreme Court seats. Um, uh, and then you have uh, the, the, uh, the submission of the nomination to the Senate, uh, the Senate acting upon that uh, nomination by confirmation. Confirmation is a condition precedent to the um, uh, act of appointment. Uh, and the president, uh, perhaps you can correct me, Steve, but I think this flows from Marbury versus Madison, uh, the president, uh, post confirmation has the, the freedom not to um, appoint the individual. Uh, so there's a discretionary act a afterwards uh, in, in, in which he makes the appointment. Um, uh, and uh, so those are the three steps and the appointment itself in this case, assuming confirmation occurs uh, before then um, uh, would take place uh, sometime uh, right after the end of the term, um, uh, probably immediately upon Justice Breyer's uh, confirmation, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, resignation taking effect. He, uh, he has not actually um, resigned or, or stated a firm intention to resign. He's just, um, uh, he's just announced that, he's, that, he, that he thinks he's going to. Um, one of my uh, fears, frankly, back when uh, Justice O'Connor's uh, uh, vacancy was pending is that she might decide, especially after the chief's death, that, oh, she wasn't going to resign after all and try to Retract that, which would have been, uh, you know, created quite a mess. And you know, in theory, um, Justice Breyer could decide uh, any time uh, between now and the end of June that actually he really likes his job, and uh, you know, he'd rather stay on. In which case, no vacancy would arise, and uh, the, uh, the the Senate's confirmation would, um, uh, I guess you might say, say be a, a moot act. I, th that is certainly theoretically possible. <laughs> whether whether that's pro whether we whether we can expect that or not, it's, it's right. And you know, yeah. Uh, you're, you're bringing me back to the various OLC questions about the distinction between nominations, consent, and appointment. Um, but uh, but yeah, it obviously will require a vacancy. But there's no reason to think that Justice Breyer will not follow through on on his intent. But we will have. But we are. It looks like. You tell me on the on the timing uh, that assuming uh, Judge Jackson is is confirmed. Uh, that there will be this gap in which, um, you know, basically the president will be waiting for an actual vacancy in which he can sign the commission and uh, and appoint her uh, to yeah. that. Let me just say that 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 happened um, for a, uh, I believe, an Eleventh Circuit judge. I'm forgetting now whether it was uh, in the Trump administration. I uh, I believe it may have been Corey or Cody Wilson. I perhaps had the name wrong, and I may even have this may even have the state wrong. But there there was a um, I believe it was uh, the Eleventh Circuit uh, Chief Judge Ed Carnes who announced his, his that he would be taking senior status on a date certain nine months hence, and uh, his uh, President Trump nominated and the Senate fairly promptly confirmed a uh, sitting district judge who continued in that capacity um, for quite a while until the vacancy mm -hmm. actually arose. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's always, and, and that happens with all kinds of appointments. Uh, the appointment has to be made. So, um, you know, there's, there's nothing, maybe somewhat unusual on the Supreme Court, um, given the timing, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, it's not a hard legal question in terms of whether it can happen. Um, uh, let me, <clears throat> uh, let me ask another another question we have here, uh, and this is this is something maybe we talked about it earlier on. But is there anything that Republicans should do here to respond to the the burgeoning asymmetry between Democratic and GOP nominee treatment? Uh, the questioner says Dem appointees get coronated, GOP nominees have their yearbooks scrutinized for uh, you know various sophomoric references. Well, look, I think uh, the the asymmetry which obviously exists um, is something that um, in many ways cuts in our favor. Um, when you look what happened in the 2018 Senate elections, I think you saw the people uh, respond to a lot of the ugliness um, that um, had resulted on the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation. Um, you know, I think we should um, fight this on, on, the, on the high ground. I think nothing comes from uh, descending into the sewer. Uh, among other things, um, you know, the, the left has the media behind it. Uh, so any any mistake made on our side is going to be um, highlighted uh, forever. Uh, and, you know, the most, um, you know, grotesque behavior on their side, including, for example, you know, now Majority Leader Schumer standing on the steps of the Supreme Court and saying, I think, I hope this is close, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, you know, if you con We're continue with these guys' you. decisions. We're, yeah, you're not going to know. You're not going to know what he, that was his exact phrase. He, he called him Gorsuch Kavanaugh, not Justice Gorsuch, just Justice Kavanaugh. You're not going to know what hit you. I mean, what a thuggish comment. Yet, how many you know? Uh, how how uh, how many people in the American public have in mind that 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 uh, that, that that Schumer made that comment? I, I will add, he, he <clears throat> apologized. Um, I think after the Chief Justice complained about, it, he offered a sort of apology, but uh, you know, no one saw it as as, as not in character. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, the, the decline of civil discourse is also likewise another uh, theme that uh, it affects the judicial nomination process and, you know, frankly, much of the rest of our, our politics. Um, any doubt uh, that there will be unanimity on the Democratic side uh, when it comes to supporting uh, Judge Jackson? No, I can't imagine that there won't be unanimity. Uh, look, the easiest vote um, for a uh, same party senator is to support uh, a same party president Supreme Court nomination. Uh, you've had, um, uh, I believe, uh, universal support from the Democratic side for all the lower court uh, nominees. Um, I believe Lindsey Graham from the Republican side has also supported all of them. One, one footnote here is um, that the, um, a senator from New Mexico, uh, Lujan, uh, I'm forgetting now, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his, his first uh, name, but uh, a poor guy only, 40, only 49 years old suffered a stroke some weeks ago, and he, he uh, has said he intends to be back in D.C. and, you know, uh, God willing, he, he will be. But um, uh, you never know what might happen with, um, you know, health crises like that um, to prevent uh, someone from voting. But I, I can't imagine that anyone would, uh, anyone on the Democratic side would show up to vote no. Which th 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 does remind me, though, that um, uh, my former con law professor, uh, Larry Tribe, uh, uh, opined during the Amy Coney Barrett process that the vice president's tie-breaking vote somehow doesn't kick in on nominations. Uh, um, uh, I think it's a, a, a baseless um, kooky theory. Um, but, um, uh, you know, he, he, I, I suppose to his credit, he, he continues to um, adhere to it now. But, um, you know, I, I think it's... Uh, you know, I've made clear that I believe Kamala Harris does have the tie-breaking vote. I think um, virtually everyone uh, agrees. And if somehow you end up with a 50-50 a, a tie, which I don't particularly expect, <clears throat> um, uh, Kamala Harris um, will cast the tie-breaking vote. Yeah, sure. I that that sounds that sounds right to me, uh, frankly. On the from the standpoint of the Constitution, um, hard question but, there. But um, and uh, and and what do you think? Um, you're actually, I'll, uh, actually, let, let me ask, I'll ask one of the questions here before, um, uh, is there any extent, uh, to which the nomination, uh, moving forward while Justice Breyer continues to serve has some kind of lame duck effect on his influence within the court? 
especially with regard to some of the more contentious cases currently on the docket? Well, that's interesting. Um, I need to look. I believe that the Ginsburg hearing back in 93 um, occurred um, in June um, uh, towards the end of the term. Um, you know, I, I think that Breyer's lame duck status, so to speak, might have been illustrated in an oral argument yesterday when uh, a, a counsel um, responded to one of his uh, interesting hypotheticals by saying, oh, that actually helps. And, and uh, Justice Kagan uh, uh, interjected that it's uh, rare that a counsel ever uh, has responded to one of Justice Breyer's hypotheticals <laughs> by saying that helps. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't think that um, his uh, lame duck status is going to affect how he does how he decides things. This isn't like a a, a politician who um, has um, you know who won't be um, in office again. Um, I, I I don't think that um, it will have uh, an, an impact, but we'll see. I mean, if he decides to uh, you know. Uh, show his colors in some wild way, or perhaps you know join uh, invoke foreign law to explain why Mississippi's um, uh, ban on 15 weeks is constitutionally permissible. Well, you know, that, that, that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. Let me just do uh, two, uh, uh, two quick questions. One, one is uh, Judge Jackson um, is uh, apparently on the, uh, the Board of Overseers of Harvard University. Uh, do, to your mind, does that affect uh, whether she is in a position to uh, participate in here in the, the affirmative action case uh, for Harvard that the court will hear next term? Well, on, on its face, it sure seems to me to make a compelling case that um, she uh, uh, cannot take part in the case. I mean, she has been on the Board of Overseers throughout the, the period of time in which this case has been filed. Um, Perhaps she will uh, step down as soon as she's confirmed, but that doesn't change uh, where she's been. Now, uh, it's possible that she has um, made clear that she recuses herself entirely from um, an issue like this. I, I, I've seen that when she ran for the Board of Overseers and uh, was asked to fill out some sort of issues sheet, um, she declined based on her judicial service to answer some question concerning um, racial preferences and admissions. I, uh, you know, I'm not inclined to think that'd be a sufficient basis uh, for her um, not to um, recuse, um, but, uh, you know, that perhaps that would warrant um, uh, greater um, discussion. There's also, I'll, I'll highlight per perhaps an issue about the, uh, uh, what authority the uh, Board of Overseers ha has versus a separate board, uh, apparently called the Board of Fellows. And um, apparently, um, these are two boards that both have some operating authority. It's not the case that one is advisory and the other is not. Uh, and, and the actual um, defendant in the case um, is this other board. I, get, you know, I believe it's called the Board of Fellows. I may have the, uh, the, the name off a little bit. Okay. And, and, and I know you're a Harvard graduate. Would, would you be interested in filling the vacancy on the Board of Overseers if so you know, I, 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 I've gotten so tired of these invitations from them. I just don't know. <laughs> it's tough. Um, all right, last, last question, I think, since we're, we're actually a little bit over time. Um, what um, We talked about the likelihood of unanimity uh, in the Democratic caucus. Uh, what do you expect uh, in the uh, Republican caucus? You know, what, what, what do we expect to see um, uh, going forward? Well, uh, you know, I would expect... Um, if I were if I were betting, I would uh, expect a non-zero number of uh, Republican senators to uh, support the nomination. Um, I, I would guess, um, uh, you know, probably between one and five. Um, is it far-fetched the number could be higher? No. Uh, you know, is it possible the number could be um, uh, one or two or even zero? Uh, yes. Um, but uh, again, I think we're going to see a... a, a um, a very quiet process unfold. Uh, I hope very much that Republican senators use this occasion to remind the American people of the stark difference um, between the um, originalism, textualism, conservative judicial principles on the one hand, and the make it up as you go along um, uh, approach that you know 
sometimes it's called pragmatism, sometimes it's called, you know, progressivism, but uh, it's just, um, you know, a, 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 a um, license for a justice to read constitutional provisions and legal text, however, um, however, however she wants to. Yeah, well, it, it will be interesting. Um, and thank you, Ed, for uh, you know for doing this. And I, I certainly look forward to continuing to read your uh, comments and writings on this as the process unfolds. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I remind everybody uh, to take a look at their emails for future Federal Society events. And uh, thanks everybody for participating here.